Uh, my name is David Todd. Uh, today is, is November 13th, 2004. We're at Rice University um, in Houston, Texas, and, and we're sort of gathered here uh, on the occasion of the Lynn Lowry Symposium that was organized by Peckwood Garden. Um, but it's given us a chance to visit with uh, a number of friends and colleagues and students of, of Lynn Lowry, a famous plantsman. And one of those uh, illustrious crew is, is here today, um, Mike Shoup, who is um, head of the Antique Rose Emporium in, in Brenham and president of the Heritage Rose Society. And uh, I wanted to thank you for taking time to come and talk a little bit about Lynn and, and his impact on, on yourself and, and yeah. on the well, plant world in general. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I, um, you know, it, it's been a nice journey kind of going back and, and, and rediscovering some of our my earlier jaunts with Lynn, and, and so I love the opportunity to kind of to visit with him. I, I remember meeting Lynn first time as a student at Texas A&M. This is back in 1973, I believe was the date that I first became acquainted with Lynn Lowry. No, that's wrong. It was 1975, and it was uh, I was at Texas A&M. I already graduated from Trinity University in San Antonio. I was at Texas A&M in horticulture. I was getting my master's degree. Dr. Ed McWilliams took a field trip to his nursery. And uh, this was up in the Conroe area, his nursery uh, up north of Houston. And, we, um, and I remember being struck by uh, the unusualness of what, what we saw. It was not your typical nursery with organized rows of plants and uh, nomenclature so that you could learn stuff. It was, it was a diversity of of wild plants, uh, of plants in disarray, uh, you know, very overgrown with weeds in some cases, but plants flourished everywhere. And he would walk around and 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 show us, you know, his inventory and and everything you could tell he was uh, he was passionate about each one of his plants and he knew stories about it where he got it, and and so there was just a wealth of knowledge. So as, as uncharacteristic as the nursery looked, it, was a, it made a profound impression on me because of how much this man knew and how much, uh, you know, how much more organization really was there in his head. And so this was my first acquaintance with him. And um, I didn't think much of it at the time. I didn't realize I'd be going into the business. I didn't know what I was be doing. I was a student. But, you know, lo and behold, uh, several years later, I did go into business for myself and, and operated a nursery uh, that we loosely called containerized plants. And uh, we grew ordinary material like ligustrums and Asiatic jasmines and privets and the very common stuff that fills up, you know, our garden centers every, you know, every year. And uh, was successful at that for a couple of years, but realizing that I'm competing with much larger nurseries and many more nurseries growing the same material, we had to create a niche. And this was, uh, this was born out of the fact that uh, the economy was, was going south in Texas in the early 80s. And so our business was struggling, and we did have to compete. So in order to create a niche, I started looking at the natives again. And uh, this opened my eyes up again to that acquaintance with Lynn. I knew he still had a nursery and was still, you know, walking around and, 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 and selling these plants and felt like this was an opportunity to offer, uh, you know, some, some plants that evolved here in Texas as alternatives to these overused ligustrums that, that the garden centers had. So um, that's how essentially I became a little bit more aware of Lynn's work. Not, you know, our initial encounter at Texas A&M and then secondarily when I opened my nursery and started selling uh, plants, realizing that native plants could give me a, a niche that may insulate me from the competition. And so we started collecting uh, plants in the back roads of Texas, uh, you know, and we found uh, yopons and different things. But... Uh, the, the biggest efforts or the bis, biggest successes always came from, from Lynn sharing stuff. And our gardens, uh, we went to the conventions and we had a catalog made full of native plants and sketches of these, these plants. And so we were offering to the public, uh, in, in a way, I guess we were competitors of Lynn. 
but he would have never thought that because he was so generous. He wanted everybody to succeed in, in getting these plants, these native plants out into the environment. Um, but for me, you know, this was a hard time, and we struggled with the nursery. And uh, in, the, uh, in the early 80s, I took a trip with him to Del Rio, uh, and I took a trip with Tom Merrick, who is now the owner of Magnolia Gardens here in, in uh, just outside of Houston in, in Magnolia. And, uh, and that was a very memorable trip because we went on a boat ride across Lake Amistad to this little area, this remote area that, that you can't even get to by foot. Uh, it, it would appear uh, we had to get you know we had to get a we had to get in a boat to do it, and um, we walked on this real rocky terrain and found wonderful uh, Quercus cambii, uh, Texas pistache, and and he was so generous and so uh, such a teacher and and uh, uh, was uh, really made an impression on Tom and I. Uh, uh, on that trip, and 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 he even said that you know, there's some dwarf forms of this Texas pistache that would make a good landscape plant in the industry, you know. And so this, I thought so too. And they were beautiful plants. And uh, I set out. I even I invested a couple of thousand dollars in a in a in a tissue culture uh, process to see if I could get some of this dwarf this dwarf form of Texas pistache mass produced and grow it in our nursery and sell it. I felt like I'd have the market cornered. And it didn't work out. Uh, the tissue culture did not work out. But, uh, you know, this is one of the one of the types of trips that, that he shared. He also shared a lot of information, of one, one of which I, I spoke of earlier today, was the, um, the, the, the lore of these plants. He had so many tricks and so many uh, uh, little bits of information about each plant, and he... And the discovery of that, you know, was was and the way he portrayed that to people was magnificent. Could you uh, give us an example? Yeah, there? a great example is is one of the um, of the acorns uh, in Monterey. I, I, uh, we went to Chapinki, wonderful little mountain south of Monterey, and in that area you have plants that you don't think would grow together. Uh, roses, I mean, uh, uh, plants that uh, that love. Um, Acid soil and plants that love alkaline soil growing side by side. So it's a real confluence of, of almost two geographic uh, regions together on one mountainside. But they have live oaks, like our live oaks, which are fabulous in the fact that they are, are evergreen during our winters. Well, they have the same thing, but they're much larger leafed. And so the, the one of them is the Quercus polymorpha and the other one's Quercus rhizophylla, and they're just wonderful forest of these plants. So we collected acorns. And he says that uh, in order to get through the, through the uh, uh, back into, across the border into the states, they, they, these seeds have to be perfectly clean. If they see any worms or any bugs on them, you know, they'll, they'll throw them away. And he said a certain trick about getting the worms to, to, to kill the worms so that they don't have any is to put them in, in water and bring the heat up to about 120 degrees, and that kills the larva but doesn't hurt the viability of the seed. And he says the way you do that, you stir this with your bare hands. You put, you put the, your hands into the water and stir the water and have it start cooking. And when the temperature gets to where you can't stand it anymore, you turn the fire off, remove it from the, from the stove, and everything, it's 120 degrees, and that's perfect for uh, uh, killing the larva and having the, the viability of the seed. So, I mean, this is just one story of many that, that he... Uh, you know, he taught us, and uh, and, and uh, we introduced a lot of those uh, 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 oaks in in yopons and and salvias and pinstemons and different things that he helped us collect and helped us find, and sh and the, what he sh shared with us. And so the the our nursery evolved into offering these native plants. And I had struggled with that as well, to be honest. I didn't, you know, that was a hard sell. Public was not embracing this. They're new. They didn't know anything about them. But what it did allow me, it had allowed me to evolve into collecting uh, old garden roses that grew in the same environments that these native plants evolved in. Because people in, like cemeteries and, and, and planting uh, a, 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 a beautiful rose plant in, in honor of the loved one that may have been deceased, 
the family passes on, in many cases in these cemeteries, these roses or plants would live on. So cemeteries are like many arboretums of time-tested plants. And so this is, uh, this is how we uh, started collecting roses and realized we had an opportunity in selling a lot of these adapted roses. Uh, uh, and, and we made a much more viable business out of that. But our gardens today, we have, we have one in San Antonio, one in Brenham. They offer the roses, and that's, that's the main uh, you know, hook that, that we have, uh, you know, and the main branding, I guess you would you say, that the Antique Rose Emporium has. But our gardens are full of his natives, and they marriage in with the roses. And so even today, um, we're, we're, we're still very involved with the native plant push. Well, you you said that you made a, a number of trips, I guess, to Mexico with Lynn to uh, learn about prospecting and collecting plants. Did did the techniques he taught you there of, of finding good specimens and, and collecting them in the right way at the right season and so on help you when you go to these abandoned cemeteries or, or uh, yeah. residential lots and collect your it, rose it, it did. I mean... It, your, your statement is partially true. I, I didn't take very many trips with Lynn. Lynn told us about uh, Chapinki, uh, about the, the mountain on Mexico, and we went separately uh, by ourselves. But he did tell us the techniques on how to, to process the seed. And he certainly, and we did certainly go to the, to the Del, Del Rio, to Lake Amistad, and, and, and collect with Lynn personally there. And we learned a lot on that trip about how, how he processes things, how he keeps things cool, uh, keeping you know uh, seed viable and, and cleaning it and things like that, and yes, those techniques are are, are certainly what I have used you know in in, uh, in 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 my collection of roses and stuff that we have since done. Did did he teach you much about how to um, uh, to actually transplant and and find the correct soil or the correct sun exposure for different kinds of plants? In, in all honesty, I did not have that kind of exposure with Lynn, and not as much. I, um, I, I wasn't, I, you know, we were separated by, you know, a couple of hours, and, and, and I, you know, and when I visited his nursery, uh, you know, many times uh, he wouldn't be there, or, uh, you know, we wouldn't, I just did not have that much contact with Lynn other than uh, this, this uh, one trip and then a couple of times with uh, other people uh, socially and things like that. So uh, I, I can't characterize it that way. I don't have that kind of experience. I think others will. Mm -hmm. um, earlier you said that he had taught you an appreciation for native plants, and um, I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about the, the conventional plant industry and, and how that's different and why it's predominant over the native plant industry that, that you and Lynn and many others have worked to develop. Yeah, the, uh, it's, it is interesting that uh, the uh, imported exotics continue to outsell a lot of the Texas native plants. I have, I have to think that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a familiarity type of thing, that people are, see their neighbors having the photinia and they think that that's what they need to have as well and they're less courageous to branch out. And to be honest, you've got to understand in, in defending them, they don't know what they're getting into. And so they're, you know, from an educational standpoint, bringing in and embracing some native plants, they probably would like to do, but if they don't know the performance of the plant and they don't have an educator or a plantsman that is actually telling them how these plants are to be planted and how to landscape with them, then it is going to be a hard sell to them to, to buy them. So they're buying familiarity, and that's why it's hard to really, I think, for native plants to get ingrained in the, in the common thread of, of horticulture. It takes educators, it takes special people, like you saw a room full of today, of telling the public you know, how to use these plants and not to be afraid of them. But that, I think that's some of it, is the fact that, they, that the homeowner just doesn't know, you know, they don't know what the what what the the expectation is going to be, and so that shies away. I think they shy away from its use. Well, when you make the pitch, which I guess was similar, perhaps, or influenced by the pitch that, yeah. that uh, Lynn made to you, how how do you convince somebody that native plants are superior to well, conventional? I show plants? them. 
we have gardens, and that's the best way. And that's uh, um, Lynn. W- Lynn touched people with this collecting, and you know what I'm doing is is trying to show people that old garden roses are true garden plants, are wonderful plants to garden with, and by planting them in in, in marriage them married and in, in blending them with native perennials and, 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 and some of the woody plants that Lynn collected in our gardens, they see this in mature form. And then they can take those ideas home with them because we have those plants there ready for them to, to purchase. So we're trying to create gardens that actually show the effectiveness of roses and natives together. And that's that's what our nursery is all about. We have one in San Antonio that is much more xeric, more dry, you know, more uh, completely different personality than the one we have in Brenham. And so the plant material that we have in the San Antonio garden have the agaves and the yuccas and the uh, and the much more xeric plants uh, that are appropriate for San Antonio with the the roses in a landscape setting. And so people see these. You know these uh, uh, these displays, and are more apt to buy the plants and take them back, you know, home with them. As far as the one in, in, in Brenham, it's the same thing. The plants that we have there are, are the roses, with some of the plants that Lynn, uh, some of the native plants, but it embraces a little bit more of East Texas because it's a little bit more friendly that way. So uh, we we have taken what Lynn has showed us. And I guess what we're doing a little bit that's that's a little different is that we're creating display gardens of those plants to educate people. If we can get somebody to come in and say, oh, this is how this looks and how I can use it, then they're more likely to embrace it and take it home. It's very hard to go up to a homeowner and say, you know, plant this yopon if they don't know anything about the yopon. But if they can see it and, and see what it does and what, it, what the expectation of it is, I think they'll be more likely to embrace that. Um, you said that, that Lynn engendered a kind of curiosity and courage in going to new places, trying new plants, investigating what would work in, in uh, the, the strange climate and soil. Right. He, he, tested the ran- he tested the ranges of a lot of, his, of the plants that he found, exactly. Uh, can you maybe talk in general about what sort of impact Lynn has had on the plants that are used, the landscape that you see in people's yards and, and commercial sites, um, it's, or, or yeah. the whole attitude about it, wildscaping it, and I was talking. I was talking to some, some of the people today, and it's it's interesting because native plants really had a, a um, I think, a, a, a big interest, a big influx of, 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 uh, of energy, if you will, you know, back in the oh, uh, late 70s, early 80s. And then it kind of wavered a while, and people struggled trying to, to incorporate and to have, you know, to, to incorporate native plants or to have nurseries that just featured native plants. It's, it's been kind of a roller coaster. Um, but I think that, um, that his, his work, and you'll, we'll see some of the gardens today, uh, really embodies a, a um, you know, a naturalistic approach. It's really, in, it's much more common sense approach to, to gardening because it's, it incorporates the laws of Mother Nature, a diversity of plant material growing together uh, that would embody the, his, his particular garden themes. And I think that, uh, that that's what's remarkable. You don't have the manicured straight rows, the soldiers, the, you know, the, the effects that really dominate our landscapes. That is friendly to a lot of consumers because they're used to it. And, and having something wild and diverse and and uh, free flowing is 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 not what they're accustomed to, to, to doing. But in, in reality, it makes a whole lot more sense because it's going to be a lot more stable. You don't have to get out there and prune it or mow it or do a, do a lot of things that we're, we're we fuss over our yards with. So I think his methodology is very good, and in, in, in reality, it should go into the future with uh, with a whole lot more application. I, you know, it makes more sense. Well, you said that, that Lynn's attitude about landscaping is, is a lot of common sense to it um, in that it's, I guess these plants are more durable and there's less upkeep with them and, and they're just suited to this environment. 
I'm wondering if there's also a, an ecological side to the kind of plants that he was promoting. Well, yes. I mean, native plants are are, are like anything. Would you, if you discover um, a particular variety of, of Texas pistache in South Texas, you know, it's not necessarily a good plant for East Texas or Central Texas. And so he he challenged that range, and that's what was so remarkable about him is he got this plant into other people's hands where they plant it, and, and, and if it was successful, it, then you'd see it in that particular region. And so, uh, you know, in a large, in, in, a, in a big way, he, he showed us, you know, plants that were not in certain areas that would work, and yet they were truly adapted plants. Uh, I mean, they were plants that, that um, because they evolved, you know, in this region, certainly had the potential of being, being a much better plant for the homeowner, uh, simply because they don't require the, the fussiness of schedules of spraying and things like that that we, we, we tend to do with some of the, the imported exotics that we can bring in. So I, to me, it just makes, you know, uh, using the plants that you see in the environment in, around your house and around your area, using them tastefully, and creating that diversity is makes a lot of sense. And he was more, he was more of that elk, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, is it fair to say that you, by using these natives, you you probably end up using less fertilizer, less insecticide, oh, certainly. herbicide? Certainly, it's such it's a much more common sense. You know, uh, you don't see people going out and fertilizing Mother Nature. You know, and yet everything grows fine. They're 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 maintained by mulches and by the natural evolution of the of the seasons, uh, you know, leaf falling and creating their own mulches, and and that in itself is the fertilizer for the for the plants in the future, and creates the uh, the energy or the uh, food for the microbes in, whose byproducts is fertilizer. So yes, I mean it, it's it it just makes more sense if we can get away from from synthetic fertilizers, from uh, chemicals, and, and you know. I know that the homeowners would embrace that, and that's the way to sell this product. Is, is from the standpoint that use use native plants. They have, you know, they evolved in your backyard. They belong here, and and you have the capability of tastefully displaying them uh, in your gardens. Um, we've well, talked about some of the aesthetic sides of what Lynn taught us, and, and the common sense sides and ecological sides. Is there are there any other sorts of lessons or or legacies that, that um, Lynn Lowry has left? Well, and I really tried to point this out this morning. I think one of Lynn's, I think, biggest attributes, and you see it here today, is the way he touched people and the way he, you know, his his legacy is in the fact that people want him to live on in, 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 the, in, the, in the concept of, of bringing these wonderful plants back, you know, into, the, into, the, into future gardens. Um, and he did it in a manner that that didn't utilize money. It utilized, you know, a, a helping hand or a, a comment or, or just the energy of his tireless work and dedication to to the plants themselves. And and I think people today realize, you know, in this based on the ones that we saw in the room today, you know, that that you know he was incredible and in, in how many how, and he's getting more energy after he's de you know it's like a Van Gogh. You know that he's getting stronger since his his departure, and so you know that that somebody is a whole lot more powerful when they can touch somebody in that manner. So uh, that's all I would say. I'd say he's just touched a lot of people, and in, in in that vein, his legacy will live on because they're not going to forget about him. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.